school I went to. It was very large, very boisterous, but you guys sit and watch attentively. I am black. Did anyone notice that when I walked in? You did? How many of you here are black? Raise your hands. How many of you here are Hispanic? Raise your hands. And white? Okay. How many of you have ever been mistaken for a race that you didn't think you were? Does that ever happen? Ah. You know, I was listening to them talking, and, and uh, uh, who was that? Catherine said something. She quoted Martin Luther King from his I Have a Dream speech. And uh, in the speech he said, I have a dream that one day my four little children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And at the time, uh, this was in the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement, you all know he was dealing with uh, uh, systemic racism and bigotry. Um, the country, especially in the South, was really divided. Whites and blacks were divided. They lived in separate neighborhoods. And, and there was a lot of hatred, dislike for, from one group to another. But I think that Martin Luther King realized uh, something that, that I preach and, and talk about to a lot of people. And that's that, that race isn't really a real thing. And those of you, I saw some of you over there raise your hand when you said, when I asked uh, if you'd ever been mistaken for a different race, I've been mistaken for a different race. In fact, uh, when I was in uh, Detroit once, uh, a group of people thought that I was Asian. And the reason they thought that is because I'm half Filipino. My mother's side of the family is Filipino. My dad's side is black, but their people had much darker skin than I did. And, uh, and they viewed me as a different race than I am. So the truth is, is that we decide what our race is. And our community decides how we want to categorize each other. The definition of race is race is a social construct where, where people are categorized by physical features. And biologists have known for a long time that it has nothing to do with your heritage. It's not necessarily your bloodline that determines your race. It's really what people view you as that determines your race. And I'm remembering that I'm talking to a, to a Christian school, so you all know that, that uh, people judge other people, but, but ultimately God's judgment is on the right? So, uh, so we have to try and do the right thing regardless of what we hear outside. So let me, let me draw this back into me. I want to tell you about my story. Um, as Beth said, or Miss Lederman, they might call you Miss Lederman. Um, as Beth said, I'm from Mount Lebanon, Pennsylvania. And you all know that Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. At that time, my family lived in this community that was about two miles away from Mount Lebanon. Mount Lebanon was all white at the time, in 100%, due to a couple uh, systemic things. Um, at the time that the community was building, the community is about 150 years old now, the real estate agents just wouldn't show houses to black families when they tried to move there. And that's how they kept the community all white. But my family grew up about two miles down the road in this other community called Beltsuber, which was very, very poor, very black, lots of violence. I remember uh, when I was growing up, it was on the news every night that somebody, somebody was hurt in Beltsuber because it was such a bad place. And three years after Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, there was a famous boxer named Muhammad Ali. Does everyone know who Muhammad Ali is? Float like a butterfly, stand like a bee. That guy. Muhammad Ali tried to move to Mount Lebanon. He tried to buy a house in this community called Virginia Man. And he, he offered the owner of the house 
$195,000 for the house, which to give you some perspective, uh, today that house is worth about a million bucks. So this was 1971, it was 195,000. And the community began to picket and rally and got angry because they didn't want this black, famous, world famous boxer. But they didn't want him to move to their community because he was black. And so the, the owner, under pressure from the community, decided not to let him move in. Uh, denied his offer and ended up selling it to a, to a dentist, a white dentist, about a month later for $110,000. So he gave up nearly half, half the value of the house just, just to make sure that the resident who replaced Muhammad Ali was white and not black. But that was a significant year for my family too because that was the year that my father started going to junior high school in Mount Lebanon. It was strange, even though Muhammad Ali was, was, was black and he was famous and he was rich, he couldn't break into the community, but somehow, somehow my dad did. And the way he did was this. He tells the story a lot better than I do, but, but he said that his father, my father, my grandfather, Bill Johnson, gave him a drive through the community, through Mount Lebanon. And my dad talks vividly about when we would first enter the community, there was this house on a hilltop, and it had a, a beautiful grass uh, lawn that went up the top of the hill and there was these sprinklers that sprinkled the lawn that came on whenever we drive past it. That's not a big deal to you guys because you guys, <laughs> you guys are from the desert and every lawn has sprinklers here. But back in Pittsburgh at the time, that was something you only saw at the baseball stadium or at a golf course. Houses didn't have sprinklers, especially not in the ghetto where my father grew up. So he was mesmerized by this beautiful house. And, but my, my, my grandfather, Bill Johnson, didn't care about that. He cared about the school. The school was, was renowned. Mount Lebanon's produced many self-made billionaires and famous businessmen and tycoons, actors and actresses. Mount Lebanon grads have won Emmys and Oscars and Grammy Awards. Many famous people have come out of that school. It was only two miles away from where he lived, but these kids couldn't go there because in, back in Pennsylvania, you can't just go to a school because you want to go to it. Here you can, but back there you couldn't do that. You had to live in the community where the school was, but they wouldn't let your children go. So he figured out how to get into Mount Lebanon. See, in the main part of Mount Lebanon, downtown, there was a bunch of apartments, big buildings that needed janitors and where they wouldn't let a black man move into a house in Mount Lebanon, they would let a black man be a janitor in one of the buildings. So he got a job at an apartment building in downtown, well they actually call it uptown Mount Lebanon, and began to use the basement of the apartment building as an apartment address that he could receive mail at, bills, whatever he needed. And then he used that address when he tried to apply to have his kids go to the school there. That's how he proved his residency. They didn't actually live there. He lived in Beltsuber, the ghetto, but, but that didn't matter. It mattered what was on the form. And the form said Mount Lebanon on the address, and so they let the kids go there. Um, so my, my father and my aunt, his sister Jennifer, Tim Johnson and Jennifer Johnson, ended up being the first black students in that school. And they were, they did very well. My dad actually ended up being the uh, class president when he graduated high school. He met my mother, whose story was bad, very, very different. She was, she was Filipino, half Filipino, and her father was, was half white, and they lived across the town. Her father was wealthy. He lived in Fox Chapel, he had business connections in Mount Lebanon. He was able to buy a way into the school, even though they didn't live there either, because they weren't all white. You had to be all white to live in the community, but he was able to buy her way in, and that's how she met my father. They got married, fell in love, had it. 1980. That same year, my grandfather passed away. He was uh, buried in Mount Lebanon Cemetery. 
And now, now looking back, I mean, uh, many people in my family are buried in Mount Lebanon Cemetery. I just went there with my wife about a year ago and we walked through. And, and you can trace all these Mount Lebanon families back, you know, to generations of, of uh, famous people and all these headstones in the cemetery. And then there's this little section where, where my aunts, great aunts are, and my grandmother. And so I grew up there. This is my home community. This is where I'm from. It's a little different now. Now it's only 97.6% white. <laughs> so, so a few other families have broken in. And when, we, when we were, I was growing up as, in high school, I knew a couple, of, a couple other black families that had, that had gotten into the community. So, so it's turned around a bit. And actually, when I came to graduate high school, my father bought the same house that he went to see with his dad when he was a kid. The house I grew up in, I went to high school living in, was that house with the sprinklers in the front yard. A little different though than here, the sprinklers should have gone, they fill your yard. Back there they go, and I, I go to visit my friends. I've got a bunch of friends that I went to school with. And I'm blown away by the similarities that we have. We dress the same. We listen to similar music. We speak the same dialect. One of my friends is, uh, is Asian. Um, his name is Matt. And everyone else is white. No other black friends from Mount Lebanon because there were so few blacks in Mount Lebanon. But, but we're so similar so much more similar than I am with the kids in belt suit or grown-ups now. I can't act like I'm a kid anymore, you guys can tell. But we are very, very different. But my friends, the people that grew up in the same community I grew up in, we're very, very similar. So that's what the social construction wants to teach you, and that's what I want to try to change in the way you perceive the world. And if there's uh, one thing I want to accomplish today, it is this. Is that you need to look around to your peers that you grow up with and go to school with because you have more in common with them than you have with anyone else. We shouldn't believe that just because somebody across the country has the same skin color as us that they have more to do with us than the people sitting right next to us. You guys grow up together, you hear the same speeches in this room, you eat in the same cafeteria, I assume. So, you guys have a lot in common. I want to tell you that Martin Luther King was right. Integration is the key, and it's an instinct for you to want to mix or, 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 or associate yourself with people that look similar to you. But I would challenge you to, when you see new faces come into your school, and I can see there's, there's quite a healthy mix in this room, that you reach out to people who don't look like you, and that you try to develop friendships. And I have one more thing I want to say. Uh, I want to uh, give a challenge to the faculty in the school, and that's that you, when you teach about race, you can't teach people to not to be racist um, if you don't teach them that race is a social construction, that it's all what we perceive it to be, not so much our upbringing. Being from a certain part of town doesn't make you a certain race. Growing up in a certain part of the country doesn't make you a certain race, but merely what people perceive you to be, that's your race. And hopefully uh, over time, as you guys grow up and in your generation, we'll reach a point where, where we don't even need them anymore. We don't need races. We just view each other as a shared human race, a shared human community. And I think that we'll be reaching the dream that Martin Luther King was talking about when he spoke in Washington. So that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys.